Okay, we're going to start uh, by just doing a little Bible study technique, okay? So last time, Doug talked about taking the long way around. If you want to learn about what I'm talking about, you can Google Simeon Trust or Charles Simeon Trust. Charles Simeon was a pastor in England who loved to teach the Bible. And he wanted people to know the meaning of the Bible, not to read it as guess. He wanted to know what did the authors want for the people, uh, what was the original intent. And so he set up a trust that would continue to invest in Bible teachers long after he was dead. We still get a benefit from that. And so one of the ways, one of the Bible study methods that he um, that his trust still teaches today is called the long way around. So if you remember, that says, how do we get the meaning of the text from the text itself to meaning for us today, us now. And we said, man, if you just go straight from the text to us now, that's kind of a shortcut. And we need to take the long way around. And so the long way says, hey, how do we start in the text? And then we go, instead of straight over to us now, we're gonna go to them then. What did it mean for the original hearers? How would they have processed the original text? And then when we kind of dive into that, understand a little bit of that, we move over to the cross. For all of the Old Testament, we believe that it, all the Old Testament points to the cross. It looks forward to God's ultimate act of salvation in Christ's atoning work on the cross. And all of the New Testament, either the four Gospels, highlight the, the work of Jesus himself or the letters and revelation and that, the book of Acts live life in light of what Jesus did on the cross. And so we're going to go from the text to what did it mean to them then? How does it hide the cross? Either looking forward to it, living under it, looking back at it, that kind of thing. And then when we've at, looked at that, we can begin to say, well, what does that mean for us now, today? And that helps us find the meaning of the text. We take the long way around. So that's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> that's what Doug talked about last time. But super helpful when we're talking about how do we study the Bible? How do we dig into a book? Today, we want to talk about the melodic line. Okay, this is a little bit more simple um, than the long way around. Uh, David Helm, who leads this Simeon Trust, he's a pastor in Chicago. Um, he says each book of the Bible has a melodic line. It's an essence that informs what the book is about. Each passage in the book will somehow serve that melodic line. So in other words, let me paint this picture for you. If the entire Bible is like infinite, it is declaring one thing, one melody, right? And that symphony would have movements within it different ways to highlight or advance that melody, different ways that it would reveal it or crescendo or decrescendo or whatever. And each of those movements then is made up of measures and notes. And if we look at the Bible in the same way, we would say that the Bible is one story, one complete story. Anybody have just a, a shot at what is the story of the Bible? Jesus? I like that. The life and death of Jesus and what it was. Okay, the life and death of Jesus, what it means to us, that's good. Now that's mostly like we're looking forward to Jesus in the Old Testament. And then the New Testament, we actually get Jesus' life um, and death and resurrection and sending of the Spirit. I think that's spot on. Oftentimes we talk about the Bible story as um, the gospel creation fall, redemption, and consummation, or restoration. So we're created in God's image, meant to live with him, and then sin came in, and mankind fell, and that separated us from God. And that history shows us why we need Jesus, right? That bad news of the fall is what makes Jesus' redemption such good news. And one day he's going to come again and restore all things to the way that it was, in the very beginning, like people walking with God all over again. So there's this overarching story of the Bible. That's the symphony. And then each book of the Bible is like a movement within it, somehow pointing us toward that, revealing something about that greater story. 
And then each, within each book, there are chapters or sections, and those are like measures and verses are like notes. It gets kind of broken down the deeper you dig. But you get the idea, right? Somehow we find this melodic line of scripture, and that helps us know the meaning of a text. We're not going to dive into the Bible in a vacuum and say, well, we're starting from ground zero. What could this possibly mean? We're going to say, no, the Bible's telling a story. And when we dig in, we're going to say, how does this piece fit within that broader narrative, right? So you're getting the idea of a melodic line. How would we find or discern the melodic line? Well, I'll start by telling a little story. Um, when I was in college, unlike Nick and Doug, I was a terrible student, okay? Like the worst kind of student because I didn't study outside class. I wasn't like read the textbook kind of guy. I majored in political science and all my friends called it why try poli sci, right? Because <laughs> you just didn't have to work as hard as all the other majors. Uh, it even had, I think in the entire college, the poli sci major had the least number of credits required <laughs> to graduate. And I was not mad about that, okay? <laughs> so I was not a good student. But what that meant was um, in political science, most of your grade was, for most classes, was dependent upon participation and discussion. And you'd have to write papers on what you discussed and read. And so I had to participate. And so I would go into class, having not read any of my textbook or any of the required reading, and I had to discuss. And so I found myself learning how to make it appear that I had read the book when I actually hadn't. How would I do that? Well. I would open my book and I would read the first few paragraphs of the first chapter. Anybody done anything like this? Like going unprepared? You read the first few uh, paragraphs of the first chapter and then I go to the very end and I read the last few paragraphs of the last chapter and now I know how it begins and ends. And so then I go to the table of contents and I see all of the chapter titles and I say, these are the pieces of the puzzle that this author is trying to put together and then if I have kind of the beginning idea and the end idea and the pieces of the puzzle that he's trying to string together, I have this general outline and overview, right? And so then while I'm in class, I like to just randomly pick a page near the back of the book so it appeared that I had read it all, okay? And, and I would pick a sentence, uh, I'd read a little passage and I'd pick a sentence from that and raise my hand and discuss that sentence all right i'm not proud of who i was okay i try i read more books now than i did in college i'm not encouraging anybody to do college this way okay but what i found now is that back then intuitively what i was doing was looking for the melodic line intuitively i was trying to say hey if i know the beginning of the story and the end of the story, and I know the breadcrumbs of how I got from one place to the other place, then really I've got hooks that anything else I read in the book, I can begin to hang on those hooks. Are you tracking with me? Like we can find the melody and that gives us a framework to understand all of the other pieces, all the other movements or measures, okay? So that is the idea of the melodic line if the Bible's a symphony, then we hear the melody, we listen for the melody, and it can help us place the text that we're reading. So um, here's what I want to do. Uh, a couple quick advantages to knowing the melodic line. Number one, if we know what the whole book is about, not just the Bible, but if we know what 1 John is all about, then when we study or one chapter, or as preachers, we get up to preach one part of one chapter, we can handle the word better because we know where it's going. And just as a church, if we're learning the melodic line of each book, then what we can walk away with as a people is an understanding of that Bible. And even if you forget each particular sermon of that book, we know God's word better. You track it with me? Uh, so there's, there's a value to this. So um, ways to find the melodic line. We're going to dig in and practice just a couple. I'm already running out of time. So we may come back to this at the end, okay, and see if we can find one. Uh, four ways to discover the melodic line, all right? Number one, you read the book from cover to cover. 
First John, that's super easy. If you're reading like Ezekiel, it's longer and <laughs> weirder, all right? You're reading Leviticus, that's a loss, okay? And it gets like, what is going on here? But to find the melodic line, one way you read that thing from cover to cover so that you know where it's going, right? Um, uh, second way, um, you do what I did in college. You read the beginning and you read the end. So, so you just get clarity on, if you think of a story arc, there's like a setting or a normal or a, a state of being. And then there's like this tension, this rising tension, and then a climax and something happens. And then you get this new normal on the other side. And so if you read the beginning and you see how this thing starts and you read the end and you see how this thing finishes, the new normal, then all of a sudden you can see, maybe I can see where this is going. Maybe I can see what's most important as I read the middle, right? So you read from cover to cover. When you reread, you read just the beginning, just the end. As you then go back and you read the middle, you're looking for, uh, here's number three, you look for repetition. This can be repeated words, repeated concepts, repeated phrases, right? And so like you read the Gospel of Matthew, he's talking about a king all throughout. What's Matthew trying to convey? Jesus is God's promised king, right? So we're looking for repetition throughout the book. Um, in Joshua that we just studied, he talks about the land over and over and over and over again. What does that show us? It shows us, A, God keeps his promises to give his people the land. B, it means God wants a place with his people, for okay? people to be with him. That's the promised land, okay? So repetition. Uh, and then number four, how to find the melodic line. We look for a purpose statement. Does the book itself tell us the purpose? Um, actually, John's gospel is maybe one of the clearest examples of this in all of scripture. Verses 32, oh, sorry, 30 and 31. Chapter 20, verses 30 and 31 say this. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Okay? Very clear purpose statement. If you're looking for why did John write this book, what's the whole melody? He wrote it so that we may believe in Jesus and have eternal life, right? Um, so four ways to find the melodic line. They all have to do with reading the word and digging in. So here's what we're going to do since I already went over time. Um, you guys got all that. Nick printed out the entire book of First John, the entire letter on that sheet of paper that you've got. And so as Doug walks through this thing, as Nick walks through this, if you see a purpose statement, if you catch repeated words or concepts or phrases, if you see something at the beginning and end that tie this thing together, then let's just like star that or highlight it or underline it or whatever. And maybe at the end, we'll take tabs at what is the melodic line of First John. All right? That was all lecture. I meant to have practice. <laughs> I talk too much. Um, okay, Dougie. I, oh, there you are. Do I need to like pin your video so we can see you? You probably can. Are you guys able to hear me just and fine? I'm gonna go get the uh, other speaker. Give me okay. one moment. All right. You know, I feel like I am teaching to my fellow Zoomers here and uh, and Nick, because I can see Nick in the room and Kelby, that'll work. Uh, hey, is everybody able to hear me there in the room or do I need to wait for Eric to come back? You may need to wait for Eric to come back. Can you guys hear in the back? No. That's just fine. I can wait. Cool. No worries. Hope you guys are excited about some slideshows. Um, fellow Zoomers, could you give me a thumbs up so let me know if you can hear me? Great. Awesome. 
And you guys know if you're zooming and you'd rather not just see this screen with the slides on it, you can go up to my little box where my mug is and click pin. And I think it would make me bigger, I think. All right, I got a new cable. Let me see here. Hey, Arnie, are you still able to hear me just fine? Do I sound any better or worse? About the same. Okay. You're okay, Dougie Fresh. Awesome. Thank you, Arnie. <laughs> I noticed that Elvin called me Dougie Fresh this morning, too. Can you hear? He's been around. Yeah. He's been around. He knows you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Doug, we're ready to go. Okay. You guys ready there? Let's go. Then let's jump in. Hey, my role this evening is to talk a little about a little bit about the author, the writer of this letter. If you want to call it a letter, Nick might talk about how it also feels like not just a letter, but maybe a recorded sermonette of sorts. Um, and uh, we believe that the author, the writer, was the Apostle John. Um, not other possible Johns. We believe it's the Apostle John. And uh, I just want to look a little bit first at comparing John to some of the other New Testament writers. Among the 12 apostles' disciples, John is the one who wrote the most of the New Testament. Of course, Paul and Luke uh, wrote more than him, but among like the 12 disciples, John wrote the most. He wrote about 5% of the Bible. Um, um, and we're just going to track through and compare and contrast some of the heavy hitters of New Testament writers. Uh, here we go. Well, there we go. John, the Bible writer. Uh, first, let's look at Matthew. So if you got your Bibles, you're going to want to pull your Bibles out and actually go to these quintessential verses. These are verses that I intuitively chose. There's no... Um, obvious uh like expert who says this is the quintessential verse for these writers i just thought it captured them well so when you look at matthew as a writer and then you go to matthew 10 34 and 36 i felt like this captures matthew so very well he writes do not think this is jesus do not think that i have come to bring peace to the earth i have not come to bring peace but a sword for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Um, I think this verse is quintessential to Matthew because it captures like Matthew both being careful. Like he's careful enough to actually highlight daughter-in-law, mother-in-law. Like he's getting into very specific relationships. But he's also like calling. Matthew is very much always calling people Take up your own cross. He highlights Jesus' uh, calls to follow me. So that's Matthew. Another New Testament writer is Mark. Um, if you're a new Christian or you get to uh, lead a friend to Christ and they're wondering, hey, just I want to learn about Jesus. I often recommend the Gospel of Mark because it is action and highlights. It is the ESPN Sports Center of the Bible. Um, instead of going into all a ton of details, Mark just wants to hit the highlights. So like Mark chapter one, uh, let's see, verses nine through 11. This is the story of the baptism of Jesus. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you're my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. And so Mark is able to do in three verses 
what Matthew and Luke and John all take way longer to do. He tells the same story. He just makes it action-packed and hits the highlights. The next one is Luke, and Luke is researching and thorough. He is very careful. Uh, he starts out his gospel. Uh, basically, this would be helpful for the melodic line of Luke because Luke spells out the reason for writing it. Uh, Luke says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. You see how thorough Luke is, even just with the like introduction to why he wrote his gospel. Very thorough. He's well-researched. He's thinking all this stuff through. Okay, next uh, New Testament writer, Paul. Paul wrote a ton of letters, and Paul is always persuasive and logical. He's like a lawyer where he just builds things out. He builds his arguments and basically sets you up to where you're like, I can't argue with that. Like he stated his case very well. I got to agree with him. One example is just a quintessential verse, Romans 8, 1 and 2. Paul writes, and just watch the therefores and like the logical flow here. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And then he goes on and for the whole chapter, he defines his terms. What is the spirit of life? What is the law of sin and death? What is the law of the spirit? He's a lawyer. He's going to like state his terms, define his terms, and build his arguments. And he does that over and over again in his letters. Okay, that's Paul. Next one is James. James was the half-brother of Jesus. He got to spend a lot of time with Jesus. And uh, in his little letter, back in the back of the Bible, uh, James, I just call him practical and punchy. Right. If you've ever read James, you're like this guy, he is very practical and he's not scared just to state it like he, like it is like in James five, verse one, quintessential verse. <laughs> Come now, you rich weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. All right. That's James. He isn't scared to call people out. He isn't scared to just like punch it in his letter. That's just how he is. Now, our beloved John. We love John. I think two words to describe John. He is loving and insightful. Or like he's in depth. Whenever in his gospel, when he talks about Jesus, he goes into the depths of Jesus' words. He highlights about seven key things Jesus did. So instead of trying to tell all the stories of Jesus' miracles, he's like, I want to get the seven that show who Jesus is. What is Jesus' identity? And then I want to go in depth with his words and his teaching. He wants to get to the heart in depth. Or in 1 John 3, 18, uh, he says, Little children, let us not love in word or deed, but in action and in truth. So that's just comparing the Bible writers a little bit. Might give you a flavor um, as you read through John and we preach through John kind of what you're looking for and you can just go oh that's why john's doing this a little different from paul a little different from luke all that makes sense cool we will continue oh this was fascinating for me guys um i think in the new testament there's a lot of stories right like these testimonies of radical life change of you know paul he was persecuting the church and then all of a sudden he gets blinded on the road to damascus radical life change and I just always thought John was like this really great follower of Jesus who was just so loving and kind and peaceful and all that sort of stuff. But as I dug into John's story in the last week or so, I discovered, man, there is so much more to him. Now, are you guys still able to see my slides or are we going to miss this? Here we go. We're going to go back to this and I'm going to stop my screen share, okay? That way I can just see your amazing faces. Okay, here we okay. go. We're going to walk through some scripture passages here. 
to highlight John's story. If you got a Bible, go to Matthew chapter 4, 21 and 22. Matthew 4, 21 and 22. This is where John kind of first shows up in the narrative of the Gospels. He's hanging out with his dad doing some fishing. Jesus comes and uh, here, I'll just read it. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Okay, a few things we can just note from the scripture here. One, John was probably looking for a rabbi and excited that he got called and he dropped everything to go follow Jesus. Two, John was in the Galilee region, okay? which the Galilee region wasn't the power hitters. They weren't the influencers of um, that area. There were more, as you probably know, the backwoods. Um, but that's where he was. Also, if you want to mark down Mark chapter 1, verse 20, in Mark's story of this moment, we also see that John's dad, Zebedee, he had hired servants in the fishing business. There were hired servants in the boat with these guys at that moment, which that just tells us John's daddy had some money, okay? He didn't just have a little fishing business where he was just trying to make ends meet. He had some money. So John comes from Galilee, kind of the backwoods, but he was probably a religious family. He was looking for a rabbi, excited to follow a rabbi, and his family probably has some money. Okay, now go to Mark chapter 3, verse 17. We're going to bounce around in the Gospels a little bit. This here is when Jesus, <laughs> he calls John and his brother. He gives them their nickname. Let's see, John 3, verse 17. Uh, this is a list of the 12 disciples. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is sons of thunder. And thunder is like symbolic of power, anger, temper, storms. There's something to this nickname. And we see the something to this nickname, I think, over in Luke 9, 51 through 56, a key verse here, a key passage, Luke 9, 51 through 56. <clears throat> Here we go. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. It's a turning point in Luke's narrative. Jesus is now focused on Jerusalem. He's going to get to Jerusalem. And Jesus sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans. If you know a little bit about the Bible, you know the Samaritans were like the, the half-breeds. The Jewish people did not like the Samaritans. They saw them as bad, ugly, evil, terrible. There was probably a lot of racism going on between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. Okay, But Jesus is going to a village of the Samaritans, and he sent these messengers ahead to make preparations. Verse 53, but the people, the Samaritans, didn't receive Jesus because his face was set toward Jerusalem. Now watch what John and his brother do in verse 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire or tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? So their solution to the Samaritans not receiving Jesus is, let's just destroy them, right? Like they're thinking Sodom and Gomorrah, let's just rain fire down. The prophet Elijah, let's just rain fire down. You know what? These people aren't cool with Jesus. Let's just rain fire down on them. Now you're seeing probably why Jesus nicknamed James and John sons of thunder. They were thunder. fiery. They were loud. They were brash. That was John early on. Of course, in verse 55 and 56, Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Okay. Um, John was also kind of in an inner triad. Jesus had 12 disciples. And then he had three that he would bring cl closer, John, James, and Peter. And even among those three, uh, Elvin mentioned it this morning, John was probably got some even closer insights to Jesus. Um, later on in most in John's actual gospel that he wrote, 
John regularly referred to himself as the one Jesus loved. Another thing that was interesting to me is John's mom shows up in the story also. Like in Matthew 20, John's mom is the one, she like goes to Jesus and she requests that John and James, her two boys, can sit at either side of Jesus' throne in the kingdom. And then later on at the cross, John's mom is there with a bunch of other women. So there's something going on in John's family. And by now, just in John's family, we know that he and his brother were fiery, sons of thunder. We know there was probably some money. We probably, they know, we're, we know they were from Galilee. So they weren't especially liked by the people in Jerusalem. And they also had a chip on their shoulder to the Samaritans. They didn't like the Samaritans. So all that is going on. Then in John 18, verses 15 and 16, John says that he was known by the high priest. So even though he's from the backwoods of Galilee, working for his daddy's fishing business and following a rabbi, Caiaphas, the high priest in Jerusalem, knew of him. So that just tells you his family was connected. They knew some folks. They could make some connections. So going on, then at the cross uh, upon Jesus' uh, death, one amazing thing about John is something happened in him. And we may look at this later. Uh, Nick may highlight this. But something happened in him to where he stuck with Jesus to the cross and through the cross. Like you remember at the, at the cross, Jesus actually said to John, behold your mother. This is John 19, 26 and 27. And then he looked at his mother and he said, behold your son. So John had become incredibly dear to Jesus and John stayed faithful even when everybody else scrammed for their lives. So then Jesus' death and resurrection happens in Acts chapter four, verse 13. You remember Peter and John, they heal a guy and then the religious leaders pull them back and they're trying to figure out what do we do with these guys. And the religious leaders say this about John, speaks about his life at that time and his life prior to this. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men. So even though John comes from a wealthy and connected family, it's not like he went to a fancy college and had a bunch of degrees. He was still common, uneducated. Yet these people were astonished. They recognized that John and Peter had been with Jesus. A couple other verses you can write down. Galatians 2 verse 9 tells us that John was a pillar in the early church. And uh, even when Paul came in and was reaching the Gentiles and doing things outside the box, John blessed him. Also, as part of blessing Paul, we also see that John valued the poor as a vital part of local church ministry. Then you can open, go to 1 John now, 1 John chapter 1. And just in the first few verses of 1 John, we get a few more pieces that I think are important and crucial to understand who he is and kind of how he sees himself, especially as he writes this letter. Let's see if I can get there myself. First John, uh, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Verse three, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. So John is a John. part of a community who heard, saw, and touched Jesus. He sees himself as a community of eyewitnesses to Jesus, both pre-death and resurrection and post-death and resurrection. And John is part of that community of eyewitnesses, and they want to share that with other people because they want other people to have that shared life, that fellowship. So that's a little bit. You piece all those things together to get the story of John he wasn't always the apostle of love. He wasn't always just this gentle, loving, gracious pastor. Like he was fiery and crazy um, as a young man, probably one of Jesus' youngest disciples. And so the way I piece all these things together, John probably went from being in a wealthy religious family in Galilee he would probably learn the Bible there because his mom and dad were connected to the high priest and his mom ended up following Jesus too, at least to some degree. 
but he was probably also spoiled a little bit or he at least felt entitled. He probably had some anger management problems. Probably the way he responded to the Samaritans, he at least had some sort of racism going on in him. But then in his time with Jesus, he was transformed. And the John that we see in towards the tail end of the Gospels, the John that we see in the book of Acts, and the John that we see in his letters is a very different John. Like just in the letter of 1 John, look how tender and gentle John is. Um, 1 John 2 verse 1, he says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so you may not sin. 1 John 2 verse 12, I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven. Uh, chapter 2 verse 28, and now little children abide in him. Chapter 3 verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. Chapter 3 verse 18, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Uh, chapter 4 verse 4, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. In chapter 5 verse uh, 1, little children. Uh, keep yourselves from idols. So it's beautiful because now we have this generous, loving, gracious, kind apostle of love. And I think it all goes back. One more passage you can look at is John chapter 13. John 13, 33 through 35. There, I think there were so many moments when John was affected by Jesus, where he saw the gentleness of Jesus, right? Like, you know he had to be affected when John and James wanted to call down fire on the Samaritans and Jesus rebuked them. He said, no, that's not why I came, not to destroy. I came to give life. But I think this is such a powerful moment when Jesus himself, John 13, 33 through 35, this is Jesus now talking to John. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So even there, right right before Jesus um, serves his disciples and washes their feet, or right after that, uh, right after he washes their feet, Jesus refers to them as little children. And I think that experience for John and those words of Jesus that John heard shaped him so much that now here we are reading in his letter, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times in five verses. He refers to these people as little children, his beloved children. And so I think the story of John, it goes from wealthy and religious, maybe a little bit entitled, to generous and loving. And that is the story of John. So um, that's what I got. I think it's an incredible story. And for me, it just made John and who he is come alive way more to where he's not just like the perfect disciple that never made any mistakes. No, he has a story. He got changed by Jesus as well. There you go. <clears throat> Which means Nick is up next. Okay. Any thoughts? We're like not quite even through. Any thoughts at this point or questions on life of John, melodic line, and then we'll take a little break after this. Yeah. What was the scripture? Um, we were writing them down in Luke. It was Luke 9, 51 through 56. What was the scripture prior to that? I believe he said Mark, but I... I, just, I didn't Doug, do you know that Mark scripture? I got it, 317. Oh, 317. Okay, yep, Mark 317. Doug, you're not needed. That's where he called them sons of thunder. Thank you, whoever had that answer. <laughs> Any others? Right before that, Mark, the hired servants in the boat, they talked about his dad. What was that scripture reference? Mark. The scripture reference with the hired servants? Yeah, I think it's Mark 120. Yep. Anybody else? All right, let's take, it's 545. Let's take like five minutes, stretch your leg, give your brains a break, and then we'll meet back here at 10 till six, and Nick will take us into actual first John. Sounds good. Go to
It's time. <laughs> you too. Yeah. Uh, but it's an old book, and so uh, it has gone through some some stuff over the years, over the millennia. And so right now, as it stands, we have 600 manuscripts of uh, 1 John. Uh, that is full manuscripts where you have the entire text of 1 John, that really old papyrus where you only have a part of it, where they take a couple of letters or even like a line, and they're like, okay, where have we seen this before? And they can figure out, oh, that's from 1 John, looking at the other letters or looking at the other manuscripts for that. Um, there's 600 of them. Uh, not all of those are good manuscripts to go off of. Some of them are really late. Some of them are messed up. Some of them got a lot of notes on them. Um, but there's about 143, 180 manuscripts that are actually meaningful when we say, okay, what did John actually write? And when we look at them, there's really no differences that would disrupt uh, orthodox theology. That's a really fancy term for just normal Christian theology. So like uh, the Nicene Creed, if you've heard of that. So like Trinitarian belief, Jesus died and rose again. He came bodily and that kind of stuff. Or theology. If, it, if you're a believer, you believe these sorts of things. Um, so there's nothing that would disrupt orthodox theology or the interpretation of the letter. Nothing from any of the manuscripts would be like, hold on, this is totally different. And it gives a totally different flavor to what John is saying they're all pretty good, like 99% like the same. There is one difference that you might cross, and that's the next slide. Uh, it's called the comma Johannium. Don't try to say that. I, I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. Uh, but in the KJV, uh, so the King James Version in John 1, uh, chapter 5, verse 7, there's a line added that says the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So if you look on your, your text in front of you, you will see that it's not there on the text I've given you. Um, and what it's trying to do is clear up the understanding of the three witnesses. So last column, if you have the sheet in front of you, um, and it says that there's three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. We will get to those later, but <clears throat> KJV has that line. And where that came from is early on when uh, people were translating the Greek New Testament and the Greek um, just manuscripts of the books they had, they translated John into Latin. And to help people understand was they made an assumption that those three things were the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And so that got into a Latin version really early on, like 400. And doesn't really show up much, except for in the Latin Vulgate, which is like the Catholic Bible in Latin. And so uh, the manuscripts we have, there's only eight manuscripts that have these words. Four of them are actually in the text. There's no note with them. Four of them, there's actual note that says uh, like off in the corner or the side or even over above it. What's these texts? Uh, put these words there. So it's likely inserted as a piece of allegorical exegesis. So like somebody's like, how do I explain this thing? Well, I think it's kind of imagery and kind of symbolic for the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Um, and so those, it's trying to wrap up uh, some uh, exegesis there or interpretation or explanation of what those things are. So it's actually not in there. You may run across it. There's actually um, a decree from the Catholic Church in the late 1800s that said it's dangerous to take that out. And they came back later and said, well, it's not dangerous to take it out necessarily, but we need to still keep like studying uh, those words. So you run across that, that's the background, that's the history behind that question over there, yeah. You said there's 600 manuscripts of First John, does that mean that there's written, 600 written, uh, that, that was written out, once he wrote that letter, people rewrote it and put it into a book or what? Yeah. Yeah. So what likely happened, we don't have the original, obviously, that John penned himself that has been lost probably through any of the number of persecutions uh, that went on in the first couple of centuries. And so John likely wrote it, uh, or we believe he did. John wrote it. He gave it to his church in Ephesus that we'll get to. 
and that church will will and, and then they'll copy it. Yeah, you're right. And they'll copy it and they'll start passing it around. And it gets so far and wide, some people are a little looser and they're like, well, this is what it means and like try to help people out. And it's not actually helping in this case. Um, but they'll spread it that way until we get uh, manuscripts anywhere from like 200 AD to like the 1500s when they started like putting together the Greek New Testament in the early 1500s. So does that help your question? Mm -hmm. Cool. Does that help everybody online? Kind of understand a little bit. I can't see their text. There they are. Okay. Cool. So that's the manuscripts. That's how we got First John. Uh, a bunch of scholars looked at all those manuscripts and said what's right and what's uh, what should be in there and what shouldn't be. And they have a whole process I won't get into tonight of how that goes. Uh, the background of First John. This is likely written to and from Ephesus. Can everybody see that? Because that's where John was. That's where people thought he lived, and that's where his tombs are, if you go over there today. Um, he's got a couple of possible ones. And so he was actually ministering in Ephesus, and he likely wrote this thing, letter, sermon, to them uh, for es Ephesus. It's dated around 90 AD, likely after he wrote the book of John, the Gospel of John. Um, and then the genre is closer to a sermon letter essay. So when you read it, it does read differently than the other letters. There's no uh, like beginning uh, thing. Like we put dear so-and-so. Well, in Greek in that time, they put, I'm Paul, minister of the gospel. And I have Timothy and Sylvanus or like names with me to you guys over in Galatia, Colossae, Philipp Philippi. This has none of that. There is nothing in there that says, I'm John, this is who I'm writing to, and he just kind of goes, he just kind of starts his, his thing. And there's nothing at the back end where it's personal, like, hey, I'm Paul, and say hi to this guy, or tell these two ladies to stop fighting because it's really bad, or hey, I'm gonna send Timothy to you and he's gonna help and crew like other letters do. Uh, this one has none of that. He just honestly ends it abruptly. We'll cover that later. Um, but the genre, as we read it, it's more like a sermon. It, mo it feels just like John is talking to us. Um, it's not, it's well-formed, but it's not like super linear. It's not um, uh, just broken down really easily in sections that we'll see. Um, so it's kind of, kind of all over the place. So it feels like a sermon, like somebody talking. Uh, for Ephesus in the background, so like um, what Ephesus was like back then, we have Acts 20, verses 29 and 30, where Paul says to the, talks to the Ephesian elders and gives this prophecy about fierce wolves. It says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. And so we get this picture that, that Paul's going through Ephesus on, on his journey back to Jerusalem. That was his final uh, journey back. And uh, he's telling these guys, hey, watch out. There's these, these wolves, these first wolves, these um, false teachers, false prophets that are gonna come in and they're gonna mess some stuff up. They're gonna do something. And so we have that to look forward to. Let's hit the next slide. Thank you, Dougie. We also have Revelation 2, 1 through 7. So John, we believe John wrote this book too, um, where it says, uh, this is Jesus talking to the Ephesian shirts, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you have at first. And when this, you'll see all this book has a bunch of love in it, and you see Jesus talking to him, you can see that something about that love John had to press into. He needed to press into these folks because he saw this likely happening. Uh, and Jesus calls him out in Revelation when John's talking straight to Jesus. And Jesus is like, tell the Ephesian guys, they've lost their love. Um, there's also um, some words in uh, Revelation 2 about uh, false, false prophets that they have kicked out. They actually did a good job kicking them out. Um, and so that's a little background there. Some other background for it. There's uh, some heresy that's going on. So false teachers, false prophets means they're teaching wrong things and so wrong that it's 
uh, damaging to the faith, damaging to, to life. And here's some of the early ones that um, we have seen. One is the docetism heresy. Uh, it comes from a Greek word, do, which uh, means to seem. And that heresy said that Jesus only seemed like he had a human body. And it kind of bore out of this whole idea that the body or the flesh, the material world, is actually evil. And so Jesus wasn't evil, so we'll just say he didn't have an actual body, and that way we get a sinless Jesus, which is not true. God made the world good and very good when he finishes it. And we can't be saved if he doesn't have a human body. If he doesn't take on the full nature of humanity, uh, we can't be saved. So this is a it's a heresy. Well, but the this, sinless Jesus part is true. The, yeah, the sinless <laughs> Jesus part is true. The sinless Jesus part is true, everybody. We got that? I'm not a heretic. <laughs> but people were saying that early on. There's also a story about Serinthus uh, and his heresy, where Jesus was human as a man, and Christ was this, this divine spirit that descended upon him at his baptism and left at his crucifixion, which means there's no like, Godhead, there's no trinity, Jesus was just a man with this like divine spirit in him, controlling him as he went and lived his life and then left. And that's like, that means Jesus was not God and able to stay perfectly sinless and can't do what he said he was going to do. And so that's a heresy. Uh, there's actually a funny story, like <laughs> church history funny, I guess is the thing, where John is at a bathhouse actually arguing with this guy and he's like well we better leave this bathhouse because you're going to be struck down because you're a liar <laughs> and like claiming out loud to everybody that Serenthus is a liar and not proclaiming truth it's church history funny i get it you don't have to laugh it's, it's okay <laughs> uh, another part of that is there's roman idolatry and an imperial cult so the Romans believed they had a pantheon of gods, Zeus, Hermes, all that stuff. Um, and there's an imperial cult where they actually thought the emperor was either fully or part God. And so when like, no, Jesus is, and they see as God, that was like directly offensive to people in the Roman world that like believed that the emperor was something and that he was leading them and we... They're like, we have a God leading us. And all the Christians are like, no, he's not. He's just a man. But Jesus is. And that actually gets them in trouble. Um, but there's Roman idolatry and the imperial cult. Any questions? That's a lot of historical background stuff before we step into structure. Good? I always say, if you love the church, you love church history, and that's that's where I go, um, and so that stuff is fun for me. I just love seeing how the church just explodes out of this, uh, out of the resurrection, honestly, and uh, kind of grows from there. It's good for a laugh, too. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> we try, anyway. Nerds try to be fun. <laughs> All right, the structure of John. This is the meat and potatoes. Everybody's scared of it, and rightfully so. Uh, the way he writes it makes it dis difficult to discern the structure. It's not like Paul, where he's like, I'm going to talk about this, and talks about it. And he's like, then I'm going to talk about this, and then talks about it. John feels all over the place. One commentary, one commentary said, it's impossible to just structure this thing with any like confidence. There was one commentary I read that had two divisions, and, or one commentary that said there's a breakup of like two divisions to 11 divisions of how this thing gets diced up, what verses go where, what verses go in what section, and it gets crazy. Um, let's go to the next slide. So we're going to give you um, the basic structure of some guys we really like. It's the Bible Project. Um, this is how they break it down. Um, can everybody see that okay in the back? It's kind of Davey says no. Is there a way we can make that bigger for folks? Thank you, Davey, with the big, the big Good job. That didn't help much. I might just read it. I'll just read it out loud. I think we got that. No. Woo! Only we These were see. mailed to us, too. Emailed. They were emailed to you if you want it. I can go 
I can read it really fast. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how to do anything else. That's good. Okay, so there's, there's uh, we'll just read it. So there's an introduction, and that's chapter 1, 1 through 4. And if you got your text in front of you, mark it. Just put a big old line right there. And then chapter 1, uh, verse 5 through 3, through chapter 3, verse 10, uh, the Bible Project guys are saying that one big section, the main focus is that God is light. And everything kind of draws out of that, that phrase. Um, and underneath that, so to break down that one, um, that one big section, there you go. Um, he breaks it down, they break it down into three sections. So one, verse five to chapter two, verse 11, it's talking about walking in the light in obedience and love. So that's kind of the, the main focus of that section. Uh, chapter two, verse 12 through verse 17 talks about the darkness and the world that is passing away, but that we the believers in Jesus overcome. We overcome that. Uh, then the next section is chapter two, verse 18 through 310, where he's talking about uh, these antichrists that come up in the church. And he's like, there is one antichrist. He's not here yet, but there's all these an other smaller antichrists that have already gone out. All these other false teachers, all these other people, the antichrist uh, going out into the world. Uh, and he talks about how we are God's children, uh, even as those people are going out. The next big section starts at three, chapter three, verse 11. And this big old section is talking about how God is love. And a good way to, to break up these two sections. Uh, in your third column, if you got this in front of you, the third column of this thing, where are we at? Somewhere. The third column of this thing, it says, for this message, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. The Bible Project guys are saying that is the start of that, that big old second section. And then if you look at the other section, I should have said this before, God is light at uh, chapter one, verse five. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light. And in him, there's no darkness at all. And those are the only times in this book that those two phrases happen. And there's a big change that happens when go from the introduction to God is light. And from all that he says about that, this is the message that we should love one another. He starts this love section. So that's 311 through 517 through basically almost the end of the book. He breaks that, they break that into three sections where three, chapter three, verse 11 through verse 24 is love defined. So what is this thing called love? Chapter four, verse one through 21 is God's love casts out fear. Chapter five, one through 17 is belief in God's word and Jesus sacrifice. He kind of put that one in there. And then there's a conclusion at the end, chapter Five verses 18 through 21. So we can mark those on our text for at least a good reference point, a good suggestion on how to break this thing down. Um, there is a ton of different suggestions. So if you disagree as you're reading it, you're like, no, I don't think that's right. Good. Like you're working with the text. That's a good thing. And John is so hard that, um, that's how it goes. Sometimes we disagree with it. Sometimes we go with it. Uh, so we got the we got the structure, a suggested structure. But as you read it, it's still going to feel a little discombobulated. So I want to help us through that, and I want to talk about an outline versus flow. Where an outline is like what we just saw, like bullet points with sections underneath, and they all kind of lump them together in in those things. But what John is doing and, and more feels like is this thing I call flow, where he's like talking and like, it feels like language that he's, he's saying, and he just kind of goes with it and kind of whatever comes in his mind that's next, he writes down. And 
it may not be circular necessarily, but it's, it's definitely not like what we feel as linear as like, oh man, if I thought God is light and in him there's no darkness, I need some help to make those next jumps. Um, and he does that. He does that in his way, in, in John's own particular way. So instead of an outline format with bullet points and clear sections, we recognize flow and grade. We recognize how he is talking about what he is talking about. That's flow. Where he's connecting the next idea logically, but not by categories. What does that mean? That means there's a lot of words in there where he says because or so that or for and therefore kind of like paul but he's kind of lumping them all together and it is logical but it's not all in a neat category and so he's like saying like here we go this is first john 1 uh verse 5. this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that god is light and in him there's no darkness at all great if we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness so he's starting an if then clause we lie and we do not practice the truth. And so there's a little bit of a jump. He talked about fellowship before in the first section. And so he's kind of bringing that in as he's kind of flowing into the next section. And so like if you were to take your colors or whatever color you want that you have and start highlighting all the places where he's talking about fellowship, you would see him have a big section up top where he talks about it a lot. And then it kind of slowly trails off. He's kind of pulling that idea and it's flowing into the next one, but slowly until it's not, he stops talking about fellowship in that word. But he's using it in kind of a logical way, saying an if then phrase. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, it's kind of a logical idea there. So what's the next step of that? Then we lie and we do not practice the truth. Is that helping us see kind of he's pulling an idea and it's flowing into the next one as he brings in some like ideas he explains them logically but he's just kind of keeps going with it into into where he wants to go okay uh, can you go back one for me so the flow he flows together not logically, but not by category. So it feels, uh, it feels like a, a kind of moving along. You recognize those by logical connecting words, if then statements and explanations where he says something like, I'm writing this to you because, boom. Logical statement of why he's writing this, pulling in a bunch of stuff that came before it. Now we can hit the next section. Uh, so what I mean by gradient is that John's writings He's bringing multiple ideas into each section, and they, he gradually addresses each one. So like he started with fellowship and, hey, we've seen, we've touched, we've heard this guy, and we have fellowship with him and the Father. And then he's like, oh, I need to talk about how we have that fellowship with him. Well, God is light and there's no darkness. And if we say we have fellowship with him, and he's like going slowly into the next section. And so we can recognize how he slowly and gradually goes into the next section by recognizing repeated words, kind of like this melodic line stuff. Recognize repeated or unique words and ideas and use repeated sentence structures like little children, I'm writing to you because, and um, all those sorts of things. Any questions there? We're gonna practice this a little bit too. Zoom folks, you doing all right? I can't tell. <laughs> <They're> doing... <laughs> Dougie says good. Okay, we're going to go. So that's how we do it. Um, we're going to look at theme then. We're going to say, hey, if he's bringing these ideas and he's gradually going from one idea to the next, and he's flowing into it and bringing some with it until we don't see it and he's kind of going into the next idea, then we kind of need to do a theme study where we look throughout the book and pick up where is he talking about these things and how is he talking about these things um, and it goes with some of the melodic line stuff so uh, throughout the book keywords are repeated and are connected to other words that are used less often so what does that mean so a lot i'll give you an example so a lot of his stuff he talks about following his commands obeying his commands that's how loved it is that's how we show that we are following jesus 
Um, and then, so chapter five, verse, um, verse three, if you want to go there, it's the last column on your thing. Everyone who believes that Jesus Christ, this is chapter five, verse one, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves a father loves whoever has been born of him. And by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commands. So a lot of love is happening right there. So we know he's talking about love and how he's like, uh, if we believe and we've been born of God, everyone who loves the father loves whoever has been born of him. He's pulling this theme of love in there. But then we get this other verse and we're like, oh man, this is, this is him kind of going into that theme and popping out with something heavy. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. That's the only place in this book where burdensome shows up. So we see the repeated word, love, and we see some ideas around it about obeying his commands and loving God and loving people. And then he pops off with this and it's not burdensome. It's like, whoa, John, like that is heavy on us as we're thinking about these things. And we're like, man, loving God, loving other people, that must be hard. And he's like, no, guys, it's not burdensome. And so right in the middle of all that, that big theme, we see uh, another word that's connected and used less often. So we found some, some, uh, some theme there. To get a full picture of theme, we need to study multiple words connected to the theme across the book. And so just in that section, of love, what other words do you see connected to love? We'll put this out to everybody. What other words do you see connected to love? I heard something back there. Born. born, yep, born. He has been born of God, yeah. Like a birth idea? Father and children. Father and children, familial language with God, that's good. Caroline said obey. Obey. That's a big one. Obey and commandments. Peg said God. God. Yep. The Father. The Father. Yeah. That's good. So that's what I'm talking about. So we have this idea of love. And if we want to study this theme of love, we got all these other terms we also got to pull in and recognize. Um, it's like, where's my markers? There. It's like, a Venn diagram. Everybody know what a Venn diagram is? Big old circles. They overlap. Can we see that, Doug, on uh, any of the pictures we got? I can't hear you, Doug. Sorry, no, I don't think we can see it, but if you verbally process it, we'll be able to track with you. Okay, cool. So in one circle, you got love, and we, that's a big old theme. But then you got all these other connected words about obey, commandments. Any other, like familial language. Like God, the Father, the brothers. And we're getting this fuller picture of a theme going. Where it's gonna go across multiple words and kind of come together. Like, how does all these come together in the and just show up? And this is the theme right here. When we get all all of those words coming together and can like make a statement about it or make a, a, a just an idea from that. And this is a big point if you're uh, following along. Uh, there is usually an epicenter for a theme. So what I'm saying is this theme of like love that shows up in all these connected words, there's usually a part in the book where that is the highlight, where he is uh, it's talking about it the most, talking about it the most heavy, and it kind of all flows from there. It might be late in the book and he still talks about it early on and we gotta track that. It might be in the middle of the book and he goes to both ends of the book theme 
there's usually one central location where John, and, and this is true for other texts, other Bible texts, where there's one central location where that theme is heavy, where he talks about it most clearly, and where he's really pushing into it. So let's go to the next, uh, the next slide there. And this is the theme of light. The epicenter is 1 John 1, 5 through 2, 6, where the most heavy part of that idea is getting pressed into us. And we see a couple of verses from there that God is light. And then we see the, all these connected words to it where light is righteousness through Jesus cleansing blood. Light brings fellowship with God and other believers where light is connected to truth and obedience. We're loving our fellow believer means that we are in the light. John, uh, 1 John 2.10. When he appears, we shall be like him, pure and have confidence. So there's, there's this idea of purity in light that he brings up later. That's in uh, 1 John 2.28 through 3.3. 3. And those in the light are the children of God. And then we also got, we got to pull in another verse or another, another word there where darkness, the opposite of light is sin and unrighteousness where darkness is hate. That's first John two eleven, where the darkness is passing away. That's first John two eight. And those in sin and unrighteousness are from the devil. So we get that birth language from love where if we love, we're born of God. And it uses that same birth language for those in sin and unrighteousness are from the, the devil. So heavy stuff. Heaviest part and most clear part that he's explaining is in 1 John 1, 5 through 2, 6. And so if I were you, this is why I kind of gave you guys the crayons and folks uh, online. If you got a color or something, you can like take a yellow. And what I did, what I did a little bit in, uh, in mine, I translated the whole thing and kind of highlighted some stuff. I would take this and be like, oh man, here's the epicenter. And I'd just start coloring. I'm like, where's it going? And like get to this point where I'm like, oh man, that, that part, where, where is he going? No, I'm right here. <laughs> where if that's the epicenter of light, where he's talking about it most heavy, where he's bringing these ideas to the forefront, explaining it. And then the rest of that section where he's talking about light and brings it in, it's kind of how does that light affect all these other things? Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. I want to color a little bit more. Color and smoke. All right, the next theme. We're going into the next theme. Next theme is God, or next theme is love. The epicenter is 1 John 4, 7 through 21. So I'm going to, let's do this first. Take a red or whatever color you got at home. Go to chapter 4, verse 7. And just start coloring. Where that whole section is him pressing into this idea of love. This is where he says God is love. For, uh, beloved, let us one love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And anyone who does not know, uh, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love, and he's pressing love in so heavily at this point. Does he talk about it earlier in the book? Absolutely. Does he explain it this deeply and this, this heavily and with this much punch? No, he's like bringing it in slowly until he gets to here. He's like, guys, this, this is the nugget. This is the core of the idea of love that I have going on. So we see there some verses uh, and some ideas there where God is love. We know love because Jesus laid down his life for us. We know love because Jesus is a sacrifice for our sins. We ought to love one another because God is love. We are in God if we love him and fellow believers. It almost brings in this whole idea of fellowship that he started off in the book. And suddenly it's like 
kind of a minor piece of love, but it's still in there. He's brought it along. And anyone who does not love doesn't know God. And anyone who does not love abides in death. Some heavy stuff. But the epicenter is that 4, uh, verse 7 through 21. Next theme is life. Epicenter is 1 John 5, 11 through 20. Kind of a smaller one near the end of the book. With heavy verses like, uh, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Super clear. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. This clear, heavy statement of where this life comes from. He even writes there, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son that you might know that you have eternal life. This is the epicenter. He's like, you have the Son, you have life. I want you to know it. If you have the Son, you know it. That's it. That's life. Some other verses in there, uh, some other ideas in that theme. His life was seen, touched, and heard by John. That's at the beginning of the book. This life is eternal and was with the Father it's at the beginning of the book. Eternal life is promised, also at the beginning. We know we have life because we have love. That's getting uh, towards the middle. If we hate a fellow believer, we do not have eternal life. That's in uh, 1 John uh, 315. We live through Jesus, the Son of God. It's in a couple of places there. If we believe that Jesus is the Christ, we have been born of God. 1 John 5 1. So he's kind of bringing this idea along until he gets to here and hits it hard, hits it home, and, uh, and brings us into the epicenter of that. And near the end, Jesus is true God and eternal life. That's a big one um, for that theme. So right now, this is what I got. Green is life, red is love, yellow is light. And these, I, uh, I would say, are the epicenters of those things, of those themes where he talks about uh, the most heavily, uh, with the most punch, and the most clear. Any questions about themes? As you describe some of that, Nick, it I like um, it made me think of word clouds, like where you oh, can yeah. Google, you know, and uh, you can see a word cloud of dog, and there's like dog, and then all these words that describe dog that are bigger or smaller, or like Enneagram three, and that's really bold. But then there's all these descriptions of what an Enneagram three is like, so it kind of reminded me of that. Yeah. It kind of feels like John where he's like got an idea in his head and just kind of goes for it and kind of just billows up like a cloud and has all these things connected to it. Yep. Uh, so with that, where you go from there, you just start looking in the rest of the book for where he talks about love, where he talks about light, where he talks about life and their connected words where he talks about darkness and righteousness and sin for that theme of light, where he talks about loving uh, the brothers and loving God, and how that's obeying commandment. And then with his life, you see how that's connected to Jesus and eternal life, and how the world is passing away. It's, it's like the opposite of that. The world is passing away, but we have eternal life through Jesus. And here's the big, uh, the big point for this. John got these ideas from somewhere. And seeing what he's talked about and looking at his gospel, we can see that he got all of these ideas from Jesus and likely all these ideas from Jesus' upper room discourse in the last part of uh, the gospel of John. So you get this guy who's who's got some money, got 
Jesus to follow around, wants to bring down fire to everybody, and somehow turns into this guy who talks about love, light, and life. And all these are coming heavy and strong at this last part, uh, or this last uh, message that Jesus gives uh, to these guys in the upper room, right before uh, he goes to his death, right before he gets risen again. I made a chart with a bunch of the connections. It's kind of small. Davey in the back, you see that okay? Yeah. You got it on your phone. Thank you, other technology. <laughs> so here's a few of them. Uh, John 13, 33, Jesus says and calls his disciples little children. And we see that over and over again in, in John, in 1 John. In John 13, 34, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. And in 1 John 2, 7 through 8, we see him using that same language about a new commandment. And both of them are about love. In John 14, 1, Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me. John 1, 5 through 10, believe in the Son of God, believe God. Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do. John also says, we know that he hears us in whatever we ask. And we have the request, the request of, uh, we have the request we asked of him. Jesus says, I will come to you and you will see me. First John says, when he appears, we shall be like him because we'll see him as he is. John 14, 19 says, because I live, you will also live. That's Jesus talking. And 1 John, a bunch of different places, says, we have eternal life, and this life is in his Son. But the next one, there's a lot. <laughs> if you read, I was going through and reading Jesus' Upper Room Discourse, so Gospel of John, verses, or chapters 13 through 17, and had 1 John next to me, and I'm like, it's everywhere. Like, if these are colors, and, and John is painting with these colors, Jesus is the one giving him the paints. He's given them the crayons to paint with. He's given them the words to paint with. He's given them the ideas to paint with and write with. Jesus says, whoever has my commandments keeps them. It is he who loves me. First John says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. If you got it, I, I won't keep reading it if you got it in front of you. Save on time. We got 20 minutes. So, guys, that's first John. That's uh, that's kind of how it looks in a, in a structured outline, and kind of how it feels as we see it on on color in, in paper uh, in front of us. I will tell you that I think there's a fourth theme. Uh, that has to do with uh, remaining in Christ, remaining in God and fellowship with him and how these are his believers and who's in, who's out. Uh, but I will let you go home and figure that out. We're not leaving quite yet. We got some more stuff, but uh, that's I, I think there's a fourth theme and I want you guys to dig through, find it. Um, maybe do that this week. Now the, the fun part. I mean, it's all fun. Right? <laughs> uh, difficult passages. There is stuff in 1 John that is confusing. Like this one. 1 John 5, 6 through 8. The one that uh, some old scribes tried to fix. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by the water and the blood. And there's three witnesses, the spirit, water, and blood. What in the world is he talking about? He doesn't mention water anywhere but here. He mentions blood as cleansing us from our sin, but what is he talking about? Um, the thought is that John is also pulling from his gospel, where two bits in Jesus' life that proclaim him as the Savior have to do with water and blood. So the first one, water, is his baptism, where he gets baptized, John the Baptist dunks him, pulls him up, and the heavens open. God said, this is my son with whom I'm well. The dove comes down, lands on him, 
we get this picture of of Jesus as the divine son. And uh, those verses where it says this is this is water, and this is where it proclaims that he's the divine son. This is a witness to it. And then the blood is Jesus' crucifixion, where uh, at his crucifixion, um, and even later, it has king of the Jews above it, above him, and that's true. And we see him scourged for our sin and dies for our sin, and we see his blood shed. And that's a witness that Jesus is who he says he is, is incarnate, fully God, fully man, able to take away the sins of the world. Actually, I was talking with Eric earlier today. Water and blood come up a ton in John's gospel, where water and blood has this idea of like, okay, it's the cleansing, and uh, there's water there, and there's blood, and there's flesh there. And you see in the, like even the first part of, of John's gospel, where Jesus is, is the Word, and the Word is with God and was God in the beginning, and everything was made through him. Well, what was at the beginning? Water. What does it say later? That this, this word became flesh. What's in flesh? Blood. It's another witness. What's his first miracle in John? He changed water into wine. What's another miracle that he does? He spits on the ground water, mixes it up, puts it on some dude's eyes, heals him of his blindness. He put, fixed the guy's blood. He fixed the guy's body. It works now. There's blood there. So all throughout John, you get these pictures of him, and each time, and even when at, at the crucifixion where uh, the soldier jabs him in his, in, his, in his lungs, Jesus' lungs, and water and blood come out, Jesus can't, or John can't help himself. And right then and there, let me look it up, uh, John gives us um, this. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. John talking. His testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth that you may also believe. It's a witness. His water and blood is still a witness in John, John's gospel all throughout Jesus' life. I told Eric earlier that I could write a dissertation on that. <laughs> it's everywhere, and Eric just called me a nerd, and I accepted. <laughs> <laughs> I've never read the Bible and thought, I could write a dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go to the next. So water and blood is mainly talking about his baptism and his crucifixion. Next difficult passage, not able to sin. So in 1 John 3, 4 through 6, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. That's heavy. Because if we think about the implications of that, we can we can get to the point where we're like, well, are we not supposed to sin? Like, if I sin, does that mean I am not like abiding in Jesus? Am I not with him? Did his saving work save me? And uh, how we handle that one. One, you have to look at other parts of the book uh, and see that Jesus takes away sin. Can people who are believers uh, able to be sinless? Context is always key. Believers will be completely sinless at Christ's return. That's some of what, where's John going? The other part is that John recognizes we're in sin, right? That's the first part of First John, where, hey, confess your sins, and Jesus will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He's getting more at that idea where, yeah, believers can sin, but they are able to not sin and able to get it taken care of by Jesus. And when you have all these false prophets who are denying Jesus and that, uh, saying he's not God, he doesn't save, he's not that big of a deal, it's a big deal when he's like, no, you believers, we can, we're able to like stay away from sin. We're able to get it taken care of. We can walk into the last state sinless through Jesus when he comes back. So it has this future orientation and a, a now orientation where we are able to actually follow him and actually do righteousness through him. So it's not saying if you're not perfect, 
you're out. He's saying, I realize you're not perfect, but we can go to Jesus so that he can make us perfect. In part now and fully later when he comes back. Last difficult passage is a sin that leads to death. Uh, in 1 John 5, 16 through 17, if anyone sin, sees his brother committing sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. And to those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there, uh, to those who uh, commit sins that do not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. Super weird passage, like what in the world about? I can barely read it right now. <laughs> uh, so what he's saying is praying to God to give them life, where he's asking God to give that person life as described in First John. That is a part of being a believer. It includes fellowship with God, his people, love, joy, victory, and overcoming the world. So he's saying that's what he's praying for. Like if I see another believer in sin, I want to pray for so that God can give them life. They can come out of it and he can experience, they can experience eternal life through Jesus, get their uh, sins washed away in confession. And that's what he's talking about there. The next slide, and the sin that does not lead to death, that's sins that happen in a normal course of believer's life that are not signs of spiritual death and separation from God. In the context of 1 John, we can be forgiven of Jesus. Hit me in the next slide, Dougie. The sin that do lead to death are grievous sins that, according to John, are signs of spiritual death and separation from God and his people. So in context, we see this. If you do these things, like darkness is in you. If you do these things, you don't abide in, in God. If you don't do these things, like you don't have eternal life. What are those things? Unrepentant practice of sinning. If somebody is continually sinning and just not even worried about it, just keep them going at it, that could be a sin that leads to death. One where it's showing that that person might be somebody that doesn't believe this, somebody that doesn't feel the weight of their sin and go to Jesus to get taken care of. It's also hating a fellow believer, some uh, passages for it, where somebody is, is hating, absolutely hates, does not want anything to do with another fellow believer. There's questions there where John's like, yeah, don't pray life for that person. Pray something else for that person. They need to get saved. They need to come to Jesus. And and, and it's normal, like, I don't like that person. It's like hate. Like John uses uh, Cain as the example where Cain kills his brother because he hates him. It's that kind of just deep, unrelenting hate towards another believer. John says that person's in darkness and that person doesn't abide with God and that person is probably still in death. And the big one is the rejection of the testimony of God concerning Jesus uh, Jesus as a son, Christ, and Savior. Somebody is sinning by not belief. John even says that if they don't believe what God is telling them, they're basically living out that God is a lie and God, God's lying to them. That's a sin that leads to death, rejecting the Son, rejecting Jesus as the Christ. Last one, uh, keep yourself from idols. At the back of 1 John, 1, or 1 John 5, 21, it says, Little children, keep yourself from idols. That's the last verse. To us, it seems abrupt. Like, what in the world, John? Give us some closure. You're just giving us something to do. <laughs> Uh, to keep yourselves from idols. Why does it end so abrupt? And we need to include the previous sentence to give it context a little bit. First John 5, 20 through 21, he is the true God and eternal life. So he's, uh, if you take that with it into that of little children, keep yourself from idols. There's so many other false gods out there that he's like, oh man, God is a true God. You have eternal life through him. Guys, keep yourself from idols. It fits in context. The other part is, let's hit the next slide. In other books of the Bible, um, they don't end like this, but they have all these personal things at the end. If you tout those personal things, 
they almost always end with an imperative like that, where John's like, little children, keep yourself from idols, like an imperative that makes sense in context. And then they go on. So if uh, do we got this, uh, those passages, big point there. Um, if he's writing to Ephesus and he's at Ephesus, he doesn't need these personal connections being made. He already knows he's going to go see him later. So he doesn't need to write, I, John, wrote this to you. Say hi to my buddy, Timothy, or whoever. Like, he's there. He's writing in Ephesus to Ephesus, so he doesn't need them. Uh, the next slide, because there, there should be some books um, and from other letters. That kind of, you have one slide there. That's it? That's all the slides? Cool. That's the thing that happens. <laughs> Let's go to Philippians. I'll give you one example. This shows up in other places. Philippians 4. Uh, chat of 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. You take out the personal stuff later, that's where Paul ends. So it's not unheard of for somebody to end a book that feels abrupt to us. It has this imperative at the end. He just didn't add in his like stuff to the people that he knew because he was going to see him later. He wrote it from Ephesus to Ephesus. Kind of helps you understand why it's like, oh yeah, little children, keep yourself from idols. <laughs> like he didn't need to do all that. Those apparently are the slides I got. Want to do question and answer time? We got, we got like five minutes. We got five minutes of question and answer time. I'm sweating up here. I'm, I'm cooking myself. I've been confused all day. I thought it was going to be cold. The weatherman said cold front moving in. Ask me first John questions, not wardrobe questions. <laughs> Nick. Questions about first John. There's a lot there hey, to Nick. go into. I got I got two people. <laughs> Dougie, let's go with you first. Who are the Antichrist in chapter two? Who are the Antichrist? Oh, yeah. Okay, let's go there. Chapter two, read it. Uh let's see. Oh, I'm over in Philippians. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got to yeah. preach this passage, so I need you to hook me up sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, chapter 2, verse 18. Children, yeah, is that okay if I read it? Yeah, you read it. Go for it. It's the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it's the last hour. They went out from, from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are all not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. And I, yeah, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. And I think that's the last time he mentions the Antichrist. Perfect. How many Antichrists are there? Many. Many. There's two, I would, there's two things there. There's actually a singular Antichrist, right? Children is last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist singular is coming. So... Yeah. Four, three. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus, uh, that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. So in the other one, 
It says that believers have the spirit, right? We have the spirit of truth. Yeah. It, and an anointing that abides in us. Anointing that abides in us. Anybody know what the anointing is? Or guess, wild guess? It's this where you like go with the oil and it's a spirit in this sense. Also pulling from uh, Jesus where he talks about the spirit coming as a helper and he'll teach you all truth. And that's his anointing on people. So we have the believers where they have the spirit of truth. They have the anointing. They know what's up. And then we have antichrist, one that denies that Jesus is God and he denies God the Father. But now there's other people doing the same thing with a different spirit, like the spirit of the Antichrist. It's not necessarily saying that there's um, the devil gets into people and then like makes them do these things necessarily. The unholy spirit. The unholy spirit. It's almost like it could be a lie from the devil um, leading to people to deny Jesus as the son of God. But that's the Antichrist. Is that person has said, Jesus is not the son of God. And it, they go out from them. And so he denies the Father and the Son. There are many of them. There's people in that day um, saying Jesus isn't the Son of God. And John's like, well, no, he is. And this is our community that says he is. And so that's, you're an Antichrist. You're denying him. And uh, that's what they are. Does that help? They're a person in that community denying the Christ or denying that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ, the Savior, has gone out from there. Is that helpful, Doug? Person, yep. not crazy, like revelation thing. Okay. Good? Yep. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So would it be helpful for context? Would it be more suitable to say that they're like false teeth? Yeah. Or just non believers or both? Um, in context, I would think false teachers. Like there's people in there trying to convince uh, other believers that they're. But what they're saying about Jesus is true. So that's a good question. Can four, you chapter 4, verse 1 says false prophets. Yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like in chapter 2, these antichrists were part of this church or these house churches. And they like they were in there, and then they started speaking against Christ teaching against Christ and now they've gone out and started their own thing. So it's like they're, they're doing it intentionally. They are trying to lead people astray. They are setting themselves up yeah. against Jesus. Yep. As Messiah. That's good. Cool. Eric, did you have something you were trying to say? I was going to ask about the Antichrist. Oh. Yeah, I did include it. Just because uh, it says prophets have gone out, false teachers or antichrists have gone out. I'm like, oh, yeah, they're just false prophets that are trying to lead people astray. So no yeah. connection. Even though John wrote Revelation, you're saying these are not connected. I don't think I'm saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make So there's one antichrist at the end. Right. So that's the you have heard. You have heard. The last hour, you've heard the Antichrist is coming. Uh huh. And John's going to pick up on that in Revelation. Mm hmm. But he's saying right now, right now, there's the spirit of the Antichrist. Yeah. And like, either people trying to deceive, either led by some like demonic spirit, or just totally convinced that this other way is true, take people away. So, I'm just spitballing here. Okay, go for it. <laughs> There's a little bit you're saying, you've heard, and you're like worried about what's coming in the future. Yeah. But it's among you right now. The Antichrist is coming, and the spirit of the Antichrist is here. It's yeah. already at work. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> is that helpful? Or is that muddy? And it one? says, uh, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was, was coming. And now is in the world already. Mm -hmm. So he, the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. Yeah. yeah. Already out and about. So my question is the spirit of the Antichrist and the spirit of error the same? Or is the spirit of error 
different in the spirit of the Antichrist. Where's the verse for that? Uh, chapter 4, verse uh, 6. 4, verse 6. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. But this we know, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So you're saying, is the spirit of Antichrist and the spirit of error the same? Correct. That would be my question. That one, where is the spirit of Antichrist here? Do, do, do. It's verse three. Verse three. Yeah. It looks like, this. I'll chime in, Nick. It yeah. looks like John I would assume. Does, exactly. Sorry, Nick. Go ahead. I, I think it looks I like John is paralleling. Like he's putting the spirit of the Antichrist and the spirit of error, like he's putting them together. Yeah. But it's, I think it's the spirit of error isn't only the spirit of the Antichrist. Um, that could be a broader, a broader uh, category. Yeah. So, parallel, yes. Is that, yeah. That Uncle Chase mm -hmm. can be connected. Any other questions? Without I had one. Or, how do they know that John wrote it? Ah, yes. Um, the earliest manuscripts all have John at them. So, like, they'll have a little phrase before 1 John 1 1 that says, like, the epistle of John or from John, that sort of thing. So, really early on, they're like, oh, yeah, this is, this is from John. Um, also, the earliest, I got some notes here. There's a couple of guys in the early couple of centuries of church history. Uh, one is Polycarp, um, who claims that he was a disciple of John. Knew John, talked on, wrote stuff. Um, there's a guy named Papias that says that uh, he was like a part of that whole community and was connected with John, saw him, and they quote or allude to John's uh, writings in what they write. There's other people that confirm that um, later on in the, the second century, but yeah, it's never not been connected with John until like, I think it's like the 500s when they start saying like, well, was it really John? It's like, most of like, yeah, like that's all we know. And then you get people trying to dissuade others from the faith and all that stuff. Is that helpful? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Nick, uh, Arnie also has a question. Hey, Nick, uh, so the chapter 5, 16, 17, talking about the sin leading to death. Okay. Yeah, bud. So I want to throw another difficult uh, passage to you over in Hebrews. Ooh. Chapter 6. So oh, buddy. this is the one that people normally go to, the one in Hebrews where you're talking, oh, you can lose your salvation. So. What's your question? So how do those how do those two how do those two relate to together? Are they related together? Sin leading to death. It's Hebrews six. Uh, it's the first uh, four. Well, actually, the first uh, first six verses. Yeah. Nick, I, if you've got thoughts, I'd love to hear them. For me, Arnie, I have not studied the connection between these two passages. I don't know if they're. I've never. Yeah. I've never uh, really looked at um, this in, in, in First John. Right. Uh, I've never seen that or thought that much of it because generally when somebody talks about uh, losing salvation, it's always this passage in Hebrews. So that's it. Yeah. You want to come? Is it helpful? Wait there, do you want me to read that one? I can, I've studied a little bit of that. Do you want me to go for it? Yeah. Uh, let's read it. Uh, Hebrews 6, verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of instruction and about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, the eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, 
have tasted the goodness of the word of the Lord and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. So he's saying it's impossible for people that have uh, experienced those things to restore them to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him in, up in contempt. For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those who, for the sake it was cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. That one, Arnie? And so I assume the question there is, can a believer fall away? Because we're assuming, one, that those people that have tasted those things, that have experienced those things, are believers. Is that your assumption? Yes. I can't hear him either. He said yes. He said yes? That's your assumption? Um, two thoughts on that. One, that that is not believers, but people a part of a believing community that have experienced all these wonderful things about God, the age to come, the Holy Spirit, but haven't, haven't come to belief. And so they're like, they see all that. They're like, oh man, that is so good. And then all of a sudden something happens where like, you know, I'm rejecting that and uh, just saying no and saying no to all of that, falling away, that sort of thing. One, it's either a believer uh, that can fall away or it's a believer that just never really was, that the word taste there is key where it's they tasted it. They weren't fully immersed in it. They just kind of sampled it and saw Christ on the cross and said, yeah, that's, that's something that's good and never come to say that this is for me. And so they drink the rain, they get the Holy Spirit is like trying to help them along. And they say, no, there's no crop. There's no fruit. And they're not believers. That's one way to take it. It's like taking the Sam's Club samples without buying the food. Ooh. <laughs> that hurts. Oh, man. All the time. I would do that all the time. That's Sunday lunch. Oh. <laughs> Uh, this is also possibly saying um, that these are believers. They have come to fall away and produce no fruit. And the end to be burned is not hell. Not like they lost their salvation and all, but they have produced nothing in their life of value. And so their end is to be burned. And it connects back to 1 Corinthians, I think, 7? There's, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. I forget. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You got it? First Corinthians chapter three. First Corinthians chapter three, where it says they built on the foundation and everybody's, uh, everything that everybody does in the believing community is built on the foundation of the apostles and they build it up. And then at the end, it's all tested by fire and whatever's left, there's like a reward for, I won't get into reward theology, <laughs> but, um, and if people have done nothing and then, they're, they see that all the stuff that they did do kind of burns away. They're still saved as through fire. And actually, that's where I land. I take this as a, of a believer has tasted everything, but at some point in their life said, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. I think it's a lie. Well, Jesus isn't going to let him go. And the rest of their life is just building up things with straw and, and sticks and twigs. And at the end, she's like, I love you. You're saved, but it's all burned away with fire. You're going to see that it was all worthless. That's where I stand. Uh, Nick, the... Nick, I would also just chime in for that Hebrew six passage. I think verses nine and yeah. 10 are really precious. Um, yeah. The, the writer of Hebrews, whoever it might be, he did not write that to create insecurity in us or to leave us hanging. In verses nine and 10, he says, Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, O oh, City Light Council Bluffs, you are beloved by God. You are loved by your leaders. We feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. God's not unjust. He's not going to overlook your work and the love you have shown for his name and serving the saints as you still do, right? He's, he's writing to spur them on, to pursue Jesus, keep chasing after Jesus. Don't get lazy. Don't get lax. But he's also saying, I'm confident that he who began a good work in you, he's going to bring it to completion. I'm confident that what I see in you, that's the stuff of salvation. God saved you. He'll take you yeah. through. 
that sort of thing. Just, I feel like that's the pastoral note he strikes there. Yeah, that's good. That's real good. Yep. Yep. We're nearly at a quarter after. Okay. So maybe you want to pray us out, and then anybody that still has questions can stick around. Sound good, everybody? Yep. Cool. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for first, John. Thank you for the way that you impacted John. You gave him the words. You gave him the ideas to put in his sermon letter thing. Father, help us to understand it. Help us to draw closer to you. And like John says, help us to believe in the Son of God, for in him is eternal life. Uh, lead us towards that. Help us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to go to him for purity, for lightness, and for righteousness, and be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And Father, give us that spirit of truth. Help us to know uh, that you are God, and that we should obey you, and that Jesus is the Son. Give us that truth, and put that into us. And thank you for these words. In name we pray. Amen. Amen. Woo. Thank <laughs> you.